Okay. Dear friends, uh, let's start. Uh, let me share the screen regarding the agenda of today. Uh, I guess there's a proposal from dear Ingun too. Uh, I just saw the email, but we can add it very quickly. Okay. Uh, in our agenda today, uh, we have two network introductions. Uh, the first one will be by dear friend Paul Hornet. It will be about the world basic income, uh, but it will include the details about the paper sent to the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty in response to their call uh, for ideas on a just transition. Paul is with us. Uh, it will be very nice to hear him. And the second presentation will be uh, by dear friend Reinhard Hus. Uh, he, he will try to present UBI Lab Network. Uh, it's a very interesting network. Uh, I'm learning a lot uh, from their structure too. Then we will continue with news from working groups and news from UBI advocates and UBI networks. And then we can again spend some time on general discussion on how UBI advocates from different countries can collaborate more. So uh, is there any proposal to add something or to change something, uh, dear Ingun? You would like to add? You, you are muted, Ingun. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I just sent you a message this morning because uh, I was um, uh, working on um, uh, answering some questions from the Norwegian media about uh, how the crisis uh, UBI uh, projects are going on in different countries. And I have heard about a lot of different um, UBI um, 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 uh, um, emergency uh, work going on but uh, it's not like I have confirmed what is happening in different countries so if we have the top time uh, the, if this could be included that uh, people from different countries just shortly <coughs> hear how um, if there is a concrete uh, UBI emergency things going on in their country so I would like to not because Norwegian media is asking us now uh, to share what uh, has happened in different countries and are there any experiences so far. Thank you. Uh, during the, maybe uh, we can discuss this issue uh, during agenda item number four, which is news from working groups, because working group number 10 is trying to understand uh, what's ongoing in different countries. Uh, they are trying to prepare, a, we are, I mean, as a group, we are trying to prepare this survey. During yes. that time, maybe we can discuss on this and also we can continue during agenda, I think, five. Uh, is Very it good. acceptable? Very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, dear friends, uh, if there's no other additional uh, comments regarding the agenda, as far as I see, none, uh, we can continue. Uh, so, yes, so the first uh, item in our agenda is uh, a network introduction. Tabi, of course, it's a UBI network introduction. Uh, the name of the network is World Basic Income, and our dear friend Paul Harnett is with us. Uh, dear Paul, uh, word is yours. I saw you. A few minutes ago. Okay, you are here. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, yeah. The we recently sent in a paper to the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, who's published it on his website. Um, in the chat. I've put the link to the paper, but what I've got for you today is a very streamlined version of the argument that we make. And if my screen share works, then I'll do it through a PowerPoint. If not, it's not a big problem. It should work, Paul, I guess. Yeah, I hope so. 
Have you got it? Yeah. Good. So let's go. Right. So as it says on the tin, they were asking for a just transition. Um, the transition referring to transiting to a zero carbon economy. So that's where I start. The most important problem facing the world right now is the burning of CO2, even more important than COVID. And they're, they're interlinked, by the way, as most of you probably know. The most effective way to address this is cap the extraction of CO2. And this is something that is not discussed very often. Children are encouraged to use, not use plastic straws. Um, we're all encouraged not to drive or fly. But seriously, if you really want to cap, if you really want to decrease the burning of carbon, cap the extraction of CO2. And in theory, this should be quite easy because 100 companies account for 72% of CO2 extraction. It's an international problem. It requires an international solution. If, and obviously it is a big if, we manage to cap CO2 extraction, then we say, okay, you can ex extract these small amounts. And in order to do that, new extraction companies are gonna to have to pay licenses to extract the small amounts. And those licenses will raise in the order of $6 trillion. And here's the key issue. It should be placed in a future generation's wealth fund. It should not be spent immediately. We are taking something out of the earth and the value of that should be retained for future generations. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. So the Future Generations Wealth Fund could then invest in a Green New Deal for the world, appropriate technologies, and any real growth in the fund can be paid out as a basic income each year to the people of the world. Okay, so the key issue is you don't treat it as revenue and pay the whole lot out. You treat it as something that should be kept for future generations. Now, what is interesting is that a couple of weeks ago in the Guardian newspaper, the Morning Star, which is a... Uh, uh, they monitor funds and they examined 745 sustainable funds and compared them against 4,150 traditional funds and found that they matched or beat returns in all categories, whether bonds or shares, UK or abroad. So the argument for many of our pension funds is, oh no, we're going to carry on investing in fossil fuels because we have an obligation to ensure that our pension funds are as big as possible for the people we are, we are saving for. So what we're looking at now is a situation where that is no longer true. So divesting away from fossil fuels and towards um, appropriate technologies is now generating even greater returns, which basically emphasizes the argument uh, here is in that uh, the future generations fund should invest in appropriate technologies. Some of you have heard me speak before. You'll probably know that I don't just talk about CO2, I talk about the whole lot of our commons and how all of it has been plundered in, in, as, as per Guy Standing's book land, not just the use of land, but extracting from the land air, the pollution of the air, the use of the air, the sea, fish stocks are being plundered, there's deep sea mining, cruise ships are polluting the seas like crazy, there's other pollution, 
nitrous dioxide. But I could go on. Digital data, part of our commons. There should be a wealth tax. Intellectual property is absolutely outrageous. Uh, the extent to which intellectual property is being captured by the 1%. For example, Mickey Mouse is still uh, trademarked. You can't use it. Walt Disney's been dead God knows how long. Inheritance tax. The rich get, a, get away with not paying inheritance tax pretty much all over the world. Financial transactions tax or Tobin tax, as some people know, know of it, etc. All of these can generate revenues for, the, for, for such a fund. There might be difficulties as to whether the, the proceeds should go into an international fund. In some countries, they might say, hey, that's ours. That's our land. Why shouldn't it go into you know, our fund, as it were? Fine, let those discussions carry on. But obviously, if we're talking about deep sea mining, that's an international issue. It should go into an international fund. Um, it was addressed to the United Nations. I was obliged, basically, to say how all of this would impact on the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm going to go through them really quickly. I did it in a bit more detail in the paper, not too much more. But yeah, pretty much all of them. And as basic income advocates, I think you'll all, you'll all recognize that, you know, it impacts on poverty if people get cash. It impacts on hunger, health, education, gender equality in particular, if it's given to the individual, which is one of the key rules of, of uh, basic income. And you've, some of you have heard me before saying that children should get it as well, okay? And if the mother, receives the basic income of the children, it will strengthen gender equality even more. Uh, clean water and sanitation, yeah, we've got examples from Kenya where people receiving a basic income club together and, and uh, make a well, for example, I could give hundreds of other examples. Affordable and clean energy, well, you've, you've suddenly put a huge price on carbon, the incentives are towards affordable and clean energy. Decent work and economic growth. Well, if we're talking about a Green New Deal, a lot of the, what you might imagine of a Green New Deal is going to be labour intensive. Retrofitting all the houses in the world. Yeah? Because housing in particular burns a lot of carbon. Not only to heat them, but to build them. Industry innovation and infrastructure impacted again, reducing inequalities, tick, tick, tick. sustainable cities and communities, all the incentives are there once you actually cap carbon. Again, responsible consumption and production, maybe I should, I should add there, I did put in a paragraph, or we did, should I say, it, the paper was written by myself, Rahul Basu and Laura Bannister. Rahul Basu is from the Future That We Need and the Goa Foundation and was in Hyderabad at the BN conference last year. Responsible consumption and production. I actually put in a paragraph saying, yeah, there's another tax we can have and we can have a single use tax. In fact, you could go further than that. If recyclability of any product is over 60%, or 70% or 80%, then you can provide incentives so that everything is recycled as far as possible. Climate action, pretty obvious. Life below land, life on land, again, pretty obvious. Um, peace, justice, and strong institutions. We all know that once people receive a basic income, they are more likely to participate politically, whether that's at a local or a national level. And regarding partnerships for the goals, yes, We'll accept anybody to contribute to the fund, whether it's the UN, national governments, billionaires, whatever. So pretty much you can address all of the sustainable development goals, either directly or indirectly, and it would cost a lot less than the figures being asked for by the UN at the moment. How much do we need? Um, 
world basic income has recently said that instead of going for ten dollars a month for everybody on the planet thirty dollars a month is eminently feasible so if we went for the whole world it would cost 2.7 trillion 2700 billion that sounds like a lot of money but if you remember what i said at the beginning about how much money we could raise from selling licenses to extract carbon that was at least six billion okay yeah we can't spend it all at once but as okay we can continue with england then did england yes thank you so much it's a great presentation paul i uh, thank you so much uh, and i think uh, this is uh, really the way we can uh, uh, meet uh, uh, in the discussions in every country in how to meet the sustainability goals this is the answer and i think you did it really well and uh, uh, we could this presentation is uh, worth uh, sharing in different uh, groups in different countries that are uh, discussing how to meet the sustainability goals because uh, the rich countries are not uh, paying attention to the poverty gaps in uh, their own countries and also not in the world so this has to be repeated again and again and again and again that the inequality is actually as big a problem as the climate crisis, as the nature biodiversity crisis uh, and poverty in itself. So uh, I think uh, uh, by sharing this the way you do, it's actually tools that we all can use in our own countries to help forward the discussions in um, how to meet the sustainability goals. And uh, so far, the COVID-19 has been used as an excuse to not uh, work seriously on the sustainability goals, you know. And that's just the opposite of what we need. It's just so it work. And I think this uh, link uh, uh, that you have shared is uh, so good, but is, do you also can you also share the slides that you used? Uh, would be good. And what Diana said, said that she had um, uh, written, it would be great to share in the chat that uh, link so we all can use these arguments for what is worth in our countries. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'll... Um, by email I can share the slides, that's not a problem. Um, but I'd recommend you read, read the paper. I'd just like to pick up on a couple of things. Maybe I should have said it to Reinhard as well. But what's going on in the world at the moment since, since COVID is that international financial flows have gone towards the dollar. The dollar's strengthened. So all the poorest countries of the world, their debts are increasing. And there's there's two problems there. One is that their debts are going higher and higher because they're having to repay in dollars and of course their own currency is, is um, declined against the dollar. <clears throat> but another problem is that recently with the low interest rate, a lot of these countries have been borrowing from private banks. So you can't, the IMF or the World Bank or the UN or whoever can't get a bunch of of uh, financial institutions together and say, come on, let's work out a deal where, where we can go a bit, a bit more softly with these, uh, with these poorer countries. When you've got commercial banks involved as well, having a large part of their debts. So they are in a serious bind. And I noticed, I think it was about 10 days ago, Nigeria, I think it's got the worst, worst outbreak of COVID in the whole of Africa. It's just cut its public health by 40%. I didn't get the chance to talk to their government and find out, is it because the government is running out of money? But I'm pretty sure it is. So, you know, what's going on at the moment is, is that the poor people are gonna suffer even more. No one's paying attention to this. In, in my country, well, I call it my country, the UK, it's where I live. Um, the AIDS budget has just been taken away from the uh, from the ministry res responsible for the AIDS budget. They're putting it now with the Foreign Office. 
in other words, trade and aid. So again, you know, a rich country like the UK is just, you know, I don't, it's almost certain that poor people around the world will benefit even less from the UK. Not that it was fantastic before, but it's going to be even worse. So, yeah, I think we need to kick back with a, sh a simple message. That's how I feel. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I, I have two questions. Uh, Paul, would you also please uh, tell about uh, your organization, I mean, World Basic Income? I know that it's a UK-based network, but uh, is it a kind of global network, or I, I don't know how, how is your structure? Maybe you can give a few details about this. And second question of mine is that maybe you heard about him. That there's a professor, Professor Jeffrey Schachs, uh, I guess, from Columbia University. I had met him in Istanbul in a meeting. He is the um, leader of the Sustainable Development uh, Solutions Network, uh, which is uh, directly connected with the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. Maybe we, we can invite him to one of our sessions and we can uh, hear him first and we can um, start a discussion uh, regarding basic income related issues and their uh, their uh, works, I mean their uh, network, uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network. I will write the uh, name uh, of the network to the chat box also. Paul, are you there? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Yeah, a couple of things then. So, World Basic Income, yeah, it's based in the UK. A lot of you will have met Laura. It, it's essentially me and Laura. We've got a few other people on the board. In the last year, we've asked quite a few people if they would come on to our advisory panel. You probably heard me mention before Rahul Basu. He's uh, on our advisory panel. So is Caroline Tessie, Julio. There's people from all over the world on our advisory panel, which gives us a bit more strength. Um, if you actually read the paper, that paper, there's no way it would have been as good without the input of Rahul Basu from India. You know, he really helped us a lot with that. Um, it's in particular with the inter intergenerational equity aspect of it. So that's what World Basic Income is. Um, anybody who's interested in constructively criticizing us, we love it. <laughs> so we're not an exclusive uh, exclusive body. Please, please contact us. Um, I didn't quite get the name of the professor that you mentioned there, Ali, but yeah. Anything that would generate even more discussion, constructive criticism, refine all of the arguments, I think that's a fantastic idea. So let's go for it. Yeah. Uh, oh, Sachs, uh, Jeffrey Sachs. I know him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. Getting hold of him to come on to our, well, that would be a coup. Good luck, Ali. <laughs> <laughs> I have his communication details, uh, then yeah. at least we can try, but she's a very kind man. My mother always said, if you don't ask, you don't get. <laughs> uh, dear Ingun? Maybe she just didn't take her hand down. Uh, no, I guess she took a book. Dear England, would you like to? Ah, okay. She just... Yeah. Okay. So, dear friends, is there any other questions or contributions regarding uh, Paul's presentation? Okay, I cannot see any hands. Okay. Okay, uh, so you can just say what I was uh, going to say. It was uh, this uh, guy, uh, Yuval Noah Harari. Yeah. You know, he is uh, a very famous guy these days, and he's a uh, very bestseller uh, all over the world. And he uh, was asked about if, if basic income 
was part of the solution that he promotes. And then he answered, well, basic income is a good idea, but it's not really uh, a part of the solution because it's only for every single country. So that what Paul is explaining is the answer to what uh, he has been um, saying. That's uh, why basic income isn't uh, really app appropriate for solving the big problems. So uh, uh, by sharing this uh, link, we can uh, really take part in uh, uh, great discussions um, among uh, um, yeah, really the f famous people who are discussing these topics now. So it's just a tip that uh, uh, this um, um, Yuval Noah Harari is, is very close to being uh, pr promoting uh, universal basic income. Thank you. Yeah. That's right. And one, one of the problems has always been, what about all the refugees? The people who haven't got citizenship, you know, what happens to all of them? And the, if it's a world basic income, everybody gets it. You know, every human being is, is a world citizen, end of story. So that kind of, you know, solves one of the biggest problems in the world. The, the hardest one that we've had to think about really is that there are over a hundred million, well, there's hundreds of millions of, of children around the world who've got no guardians, they're street children. How do you get to them? Well, I'm sure we could, but you know, that's, that's probably, they're probably the hardest ones to get to, but you know. Anyway. I could go on forever. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Uh, any other friends who would like to contribute? Uh, oh, we have two pages. I cannot see uh, any other contributions. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so we can continue with our second item in our agenda. Uh, dear Reynard was here. I saw him. Okay, he is here. Dear Reynard, uh, we are expecting a presentation from you, I mean, a talk speech from you about the UBI lab network. Do you think we can make it today? Yes, that's fine. I got the presentation just in time. Can you that's hear me? Is it? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I okay. got a presentation, as I said, it's just in time management because it was a teamwork between Sheffield and uh, Leeds. So, uh, do you want me to start? Yeah, shall I start? Please, please, Renat, we are all muted. Uh, okay, uh, let me try to share. Can you see? Oh, what is happening? Oh, it's slowly building up. Okay. Oh, not, not yet. Okay, oh. here. Yeah, so you can see. Can everybody see the presentation? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, the UBI lab ne network as uh, one form of uh, organization and strategy to promote basic income. And below you can see my name. And um, in order oh, now, what is happening? Oh, I think I need to put it on full screen. You can't see the. Let me try. Yeah, I think you can see the. Um, just to, I'm actually German, living in 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 the UK in Leeds. Uh, I put my name there because that's how it's written in German. It's a letter which doesn't exist anywhere else, just out of fun. And um, where do I come from to the basic income? I think it's always important to understand where a person comes from because uh, I think there is nothing such as the truth, but there are many different perspectives and one can just try to be truthful. So in 1990, I wrote in my Master of Public Health dissertation, any attempt of a technical solution for the global health problems of today is likely to fail if it avoids to address the underlying ethical challenge whether all human beings are ends or many are means for the ends of some. 
for the philosophers among us, you will see that I have sort of basically used the phrase of Kant, who was a German philosopher of ethics. And I also put the human declaration, universal declaration of human rights below all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And most people talk about it and uh, take this as a sort of, yeah, for granted. But since 1990, I've always asked myself, how can it be put in practice? What is, does it actually mean in reality? Because I see a lot of people who are not sort of uh, allowed to live in dignity every day. So in 2001, I came across uh, the basic income and I thought this is the answer for uh, this question and what I try to address. And since then, ever since, I have been a sort of a strong supporter of the basic income. Now to come to the uh, presentation, I give, this is the overview. I first talk about our purpose of the UBI lab network and then a bit of history, our, how we operate and the future outlook. Now, basically one part of the purpose is yeah, let's try UBI, because whenever you mention basic income or universal basic income or unconditional basic income, there's a lot of skepticism. As either it doesn't work, it cannot be afforded, and so on and so on. And you end up in endless discussions whether it's actually uh, realistic and achievable. So the UBI lab says simply, let's just try it. I mean, uh, many other political ideas and proposals uh, are tried with uh, much less evidence than already exists on uh, basic income. So we say, even if you are skeptic, even if you have doubts, let's try it and let's uh, test it, either at a national or at a local level. And that's where our name comes from, Universal Basic Income Lab stands for laboratory. And here is a sort of summary of what uh, we uh, think uh, is our purpose. We believe that there are better ways to provide security to citizens and build more resilient economies. The way we find and test these alternatives is by enabling and resourcing citizens from the grassroots up to engage with civic and political society to explore the potential of a universal basic income for all. We seek to test the impact a UBI could have and evaluate how it might provide the foundations for us to be able to tackle so many of the challenges we face as individuals, communities, society, and the planet. Now, next, so this is a summer, basically a quick overview of our purpose. Now, I would like to talk briefly about the history of UBI Lab. And UBI Lab, actually started in Sheffield in the UK, United Kingdom. And there is a civil society organization called Opus Independence, which exists since 2008. And uh, they try to promote citizens' initiatives. And uh, one of their leading phrases from Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And so they try and support uh, many different initiatives. One of the probably more well-known ones is called City of Debate, and uh, where political discussions are encouraged, people are encouraged to participate. In the past, this was a sort of contact event every year. This year, because of COVID, it's taking place online. And as part of this uh, City of Debate in 2016, this idea of a basic income group came about. And um, this basic income group decided in the end to call themselves UBI Lab Sheffield. And one of the me uh, members was very active already before in creating social franchising global networks, such as Petra Kutcher Night, Sheffield Soup, so far. And you can see below in how many cities they are active. And so the idea was to create a similar UBI lab network first in the UK, but also beyond the UK. So as I already explained, what is in the name? It is the idea to promote a universal basic income and to convince skeptics among the citizens, but also among decision makers by 
saying, okay, we accept uh, that there may be doubts. Let's have a lab. But lab means discussing it. I mean, theoretical discussions, conceptual discussions, but also test it at different levels in order to see whether it works. And clearly, there will be no, there will be not one perfect answer, but through testing it, we will also find out what has to be done in order to improve uh, uh, the UBI concept and how it's actually implemented. So here are some of the members from the UBI lab at Sheffield. As I said, it started there in 2016-17 and uh, from there it sort of gradually spread. And another important historical moment is that uh, these two Mark Bryan, an economist, and Jason Lehman developed in 2018 a proposal for a Sheffield pilot with three options, and this was submitted to the council as an idea how uh, a basic income can be tested in Sheffield. And uh, it was one of the, uh, the first council, local council, which actually supported and asked the, this proposal and asked the central government to allow Sheffield to test such a basic uh, income. And now, so our sort of how are we operating? So this network offers resources, uh, mainly online, uh, to uh, such as downloadable materials, websites to find out more videos to stimulate conversation, but also organizing events. And so Sheffield was a starting point. And when in 2019, Leeds people in Leeds expressed interest to set up a UBI lab group. Then people from Sheffield came and advised us about how to set it up and to reach an agreement and to make their material available to us. And in this way, you can see many different events have been taking place. Um, we uh, invite speakers from now with uh, Zoom also from around the globe, but otherwise before locally, and uh, many uh, sort of events, art events, other events have been sort of uh, developed and um, attracted a lot of interest. And uh, gradually it has turned into a network, and uh, here are some of the first labs which came about from outside Sheffield, Liverpool, Leeds, North East uh, in, the UK, uh, in England, Kirk Lees, and uh, after this uh, also international groups joined, one from Bucharest in Romania, UBI Lab Bucharest, and one from Jakarta, uh, which is the capital of Indonesia. And in the meantime, we had further groups joining Chesterfield, York, Northern Ireland, Norfolk, Birmingham, Hull, Cardiff, and Manchester. And we also aim to have non-geographical groups such as a UBI lab use to address the specific questions and issues so that people can discuss and come together and see how UBI, a basic income, will work for them and what questions they have regarding the implementation and how it can be promoted also in their group. I just want to briefly talk about the, our governance approach, as you can probably um, for, gather from, our, from this presentation. It's bottom up, it's a network, it's based on mutuality and autonomous cellular structures. So each of us, each group, uh, Leeds, Sheffield, Hull, operate independently, but we organize and meet regularly to coordinate, to discuss and exchange experience. And our values are based on fairness, democratic approach, inclusive approach. And at the moment that's also under discussion, I'm a bit skeptical about the concept of efficiency, but uh, so it's uh, in the last draft, it was called an efficient uh, approach. approach. Probably one could better say, uh, 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 an approach which makes the best use of the available resources. Now, what is the sort of outlook of the network? There are more groups joining. The recent ones are Bradford, Oldham, South Tyneside, a group in Norway, Hauga Landet, and uh, another 
non-geographical group women. There are others under discussion such as artists, solicitors to create their own specific group and uh, join the network. In the end, yes, we would like to achieve that UBI is tested either at the local level, yeah, this can be in some municipalities, or I mean, it can be tested at the national or global level. I mean, whenever there are objections and say, but we don't know how it works, it could also be tested over a number of years at a national or even a global level and observed with scientific approach. And then one could see whether it has the expected positive effects and see whether it should be maintained. So we want to promote this discussion to convince citizens and uh, decision makers and say, let's at least try UBI uh, and not just be skeptical about it. This is the end. Uh, any questions or comments? I have just put two website links. One is uh, the network, which is based in Sheffield, the, the, I mean, the, the setup where you can also find all the links to others and the one which is run by us in Leeds. Uh, the, uh, so each group is responsible how they want to promote the concept online on websites, Facebook, uh, Twitter and other social media. Thanks a lot. That's it. And uh, over to you. Dear Reynard, thank you very much. Uh, are you... Uh, one second. Okay. Uh, I guess Malcolm has a question. Dear Malcolm. Thank you for your presentation. That's very um, educational. It's, I've not heard such a good presentation of the movement of UBI labs before. Um, are you a couple of, of um, questions? Uh, the, uh, the, there's an American lab at Stanford University which calls itself UBI lab. Are, you, are they part of your network as well? Um, the second question is the um, the activity of the Scottish Feasibility Project sounds very like the kinds of activities of the UBI labs, but they don't call themselves a UBI lab. Now, presumably, um, you and they would have quite a lot to say to each other. Does the network of UBI labs include organisations that don't actually call themselves labs, but in fact behave as if they are? Um, and the third one is laboratory implies experimental methods. Do you have a set of experimental methods that you recommend to the various members of the UBI lab network? Thank you. Thank you, Markham. Um, the first question, I mean, uh, I'm aware or we are aware of the UBI a lab in Stanford, which is a sort of university um, department. I don't know when they were actually started. I mean, I, it's in our links, but they are not part of our group. I think they, I, I assume the idea to call yourself lab must have come up uh, independently. Um, it's about four years ago, I think five years ago. Yeah, so as I said, the, 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 so probably it could be about the same because as uh, I joined in 2019 when I started uh, the group in Leeds, but uh, the group has been a, a sort of active since 2016. So it must have been about the same time as, uh, as uh, um, yeah, as this uh, UBI lab in Stanford was created. But when I look at it, uh, it looks more like an academic institution. Uh, which is sort of part of the University of Stanford, while we are clearly a civil society organization with some links to universities and collaboration like the UBI pilot uh, for Sheffield was developed by academics in collab collaboration with the UBI lab Sheffield from the University of Sheffield. And um, the other Scotland, I mean, Anne Miller is here, but we have no UBI lab in Scotland and that is also deliberate because we're collaborating with the movement 
in Scotland. And uh, I agree the approach which uh, has been selected or defined in Scotland is quite similar. And um, for instance, I'm in the UBI support group for Scotland, but this group supports whatever Scotland requires, the group requires or asks for uh, support. So we discuss how we can promote what is happening in Scotland, which is very similar to our ideas, but it came about independently and uh, we sort of collaborate as a sort of a, a UBI lab network starting in the England, but now expanding also internationally. And uh, the third question was about research methods. I mean, laboratory, I mean, it's a name, but I don't understand it in terms of laboratory, just in terms of laboratory experiment. It's more the name given for social experiments and the so, uh, conceptual uh, experiments discussion. So it basically includes to mean openness to see how we can promote the idea and how we can test it. And I mean, the best developed approach is the one from Sheffield where uh, the economists have developed a sort of research approach, how this UBI basic income can be tested in Sheffield and the success, uh, the outcome and impact could be measured. There is the idea that this is being sort of re repeated and adapted for other places, but I think no other place has been sort of as much advanced as uh, the Sheffield UBI lab. I hope, does this answer your questions, yes, Martin? Thank you. Yeah. So, okay. please. Uh, any other questions or contributions? Uh, I would like to add something and ask a question here right now. Uh, in fact, Peter mentioned the name of the lady, Miss Danuj uh, from UBI and that Stanford. As far as I know, she, she was the PhD student of Professor Philip Van Pari. And uh, in 2017, we had a meeting in Brussels, so I know that it was very new at that time, so it should be established around 2016, uh, the date of the establishment of the UBI lab in Stanford. And my question is, uh, dear Renard, uh, in your organization, um, first thing is, how do you finance the activities, events, or do you have a, I don't, I, what's the financial uh, resourcing of UBI lab? This is the first question. And second question, what's the balance between activism, political campaigning, and research? Yes, I think um, at the moment, uh, the, to start with the second question, the balance is uh, strongly in favor of uh, campaigning and education at the moment rather than research. If you uh, call research, define research as uh, actually implementing an experiment, I mean, there's a lot of literature search and research to analyze what is published on the topic and that is exchanged in the network. So that is uh, quite prominent. But in terms of uh, implementation, obviously you can only implement if you have got the resources and in a sort of national structure, if you have got some agreement with the government, I mean, that will be also the problem for the Scottish one, as long as Scotland is part of the UK and dependent on the UK social system. So um, and practical implementation, can at a, at a bigger scale cannot really happen unless you have sort of the finances and the agreement with the national government, unless you choose the, I don't know whether there's any German participant in Germany, there is this uh, basic income lottery where people win a lottery, uh, 12 months basic income, and uh, then it's also part of some sort of civil society research to find out how people do and what is their experience uh, receiving this one year basic income. I mean, this has been also discussed, but has never, never been so far been implemented. Financing, we have got some anonymous donors and we have got a bit of money, but most of it, I mean, like I, I'm a retired academic and uh, I say I already receive a basic income, which is my pension and uh, I'm very committed to it. So I'm dedicating time and uh, some of my resources to this uh, basic income and I assume that other people do it as well. But there are some funds, as I said, from donors who have given funds uh, to 
advance the network. And uh, we are also considering in terms of research, there is for instance a citizen, citizen science call for proposals to submit some research proposals and work with universities on uh, basic income uh, research. Thank you. Thank you. Did I answer your question or is there anything? Uh, I mean, the f financial uh, issues, maybe. Yeah, as I said, we, we uh, I mean, the resources are basically, we, the, there is some donor giving some finance through uh, the basic income network. But I think at the moment you can still say that most resources come from the voluntary time contribution. And also made what I forgot, and I want to thank you, uh, thank at the moment, uh, Johnny Douglas, who is a, a co-producer of my slides. I mean, he did most of it and I added a few things. He is actually employed by Opus, what I mentioned earlier on. There are three people employed by Opus, which is a civil society organization, and uh, they financed also through, I think, uh, funding from Sheffield Council plus uh, donations, and three of their members are employed to strengthen UBI Lab Sheffield and to strengthen the UBI Lab network. Thank you very much, Trainer. Uh, I guess dear Paul has a question. Uh, Paul? Okay, it's not so much a question. It's just something that maybe Reinhardt wasn't, was too modest to say. There's a real beauty to this. <clears throat> like during the pandemic, the interest in basic income in the UK has definitely increased. And just here in Manchester, there's a new UBI lab just starting off here in Manchester, I've been talking to them, but it's just great to see, especially younger people wanting to do something. And because the Sheffield group, Johnny Reinhardt and others, Simon, um, because they're quite strong, they can give support to the Manchester group that's just starting off or another one in Harrogate or whatever. And I think there's a real beauty to that, that it enables local groups to spring up all over the place. Okay, thank you, Paul. That's a very nice compliment. Yes, we, we try, that is, uh, as I said, the bottom-up approach we try to promote and take up interest. So for instance, Chef uh, Manchester uh, people approached us and now Oldham, some people from Manchester uh, have contacts in Oldham, which is close for, uh, to Manchester. And so it's, it's spreading like this. And uh, that is actually our intention, how it should happen. Thank you. Any other friends who would like to contribute or ask a question? I cannot see. Uh, I would like to add something. Uh, I mean, the, the two groups, UBI Lab Women and UBI Lab Youth was very interesting. Maybe in one of the sessions, in the future sessions, we can have contributions of UBI uh, to the gender equality. We can have a discussion like this and maybe we can invite friends from uh, UBI Lab Women there and then it might be inter interesting uh, content for us too i mean uh, or maybe you can also in include almas from new york university uh, i mean we, we, we can develop this a very inspiring uh, presentation thank you very much for me uh, from my okay. side thank you i'm sure the ubi youth or women group are very interested to participate in such a discussion so if you can set it up in future uh, I'm sure they will participate. That's great. Uh, dear friends, uh, Paul, your hand is raised, but I guess, okay, now it's okay. So then we can continue with our agenda. Uh, the next item is uh, the news from the working groups. Uh, as far as I can see, uh, any Reynard is here from, oh, welcome is here from working group number 10. Uh, maybe we can start with working group number 10. Any, would you like to start? Uh, yes, uh, Ali, just to say that we've been working on the questionnaire. It's been on a, a Google survey and members of the working 10 working group have been able to 
uh, try it out and see whether it works. And we're just putting the final details together and hope that it will go live. We had thought today, but I think we've got one or two things just to check out when we meet on Friday. And um, maybe it will go from there. I mean, what do you think, Reinhardt and, um, and Ali? Um, are we quite ready for it to go today? Yeah, I mean, I agree. We had a few things. I mean, we probably were too optimistic and ambitious to say we could uh, launch it today. So I think I think it's important because we we want it, if it works well, also to become a, a regular, not just once in in a lifetime event, but that it could be used regularly to update uh, on the global situation. And so I think it's important that we get it uh, right. Not everything right, obviously there will be room for improvement later on, but uh, to make sure that uh, we all agree and uh, have a good approach. Over to you, Ali. Oh, maybe Malcolm, would you like to add anything? You're mute. The other yes. two have been doing far more work on it than I have, so I think they've said uh, they. I think it's been a really good exercise. I've been watching it largely from the sidelines and have been very impressed. Okay, uh, dear friends, I would like to say uh, one thing regarding the survey. We, uh, the group is spending a lot of time and effort, I'm sure, because I can uh, see it. Hopefully it will be ready by this uh, Friday. And also we will have a communication with BN Executive Committee, right? And Malcolm, maybe you can That's tell right. about yes. this. Yes, we, we put it on the agenda so that the BN Executive Committee can study it on Sunday with the committee meets on Sunday um, in order to give it its imprimatur if the Executive Committee wishes to do so. And Julio will be at that uh, meeting as well to speak about it as well. Uh, one thing I can say is that, uh, you know, Working Group 10 has two surveys. This is the second survey, uh, which is under development. The first uh, survey is uh, open for uh, for people to participate. So I will put it to the, into the chat box too. Uh, survey number one's uh, uh, link. So, so, uh, so survey number one's link is there and survey number two uh, is under preparation. Okay. Uh, Tony, would you like to say something? I would, thank you. Um, I signed up for this group, but like Malcolm, I haven't been able to participate very much. I really admire the work that's been done, but I'm wondering in terms of testing it, whether it wouldn't make sense before distributing it all over to send it to a few colleagues who are in regions of the world which are not represented in working group 10 and where there are many different languages spoken. That's all, that's just a suggestion. Uh, thank you, Tony. In fact, uh, this was, uh, Renard, would you like to answer? Maybe you will give a better answer than me. Yeah, I, I think uh, Tony's uh, suggestion is, is a very good one and we were actually um, considering this. I mean, um, there is obviously the issue of time delay, but uh, I mean, if we have a few colleagues and who are able to uh, do this relatively quickly, it would be a good idea to, to do such a test. I fully agree. We would need to have the contact details of these people. We've got uh, uh, something like 31, 33 affiliated organizations, but there are over 200 countries in the world. So if you know of uh, uh, people, members in these other countries uh, where there isn't an affiliated organization, perhaps you could send um, either me or Reinhardt the, their details so that we can contact them. Otherwise, we've got no way of doing that. But that's a good idea, Tony. Thanks. Maybe I should just add the, the idea to how to distribute the survey was through BN, BN members and affiliated organizations, but then also to ask other interested uh, people in UBI to complete the questionnaire. So uh, to get an, a picture of as many 
state jurisdictions of the world as possible. And as Annie said, there are about 200. So uh, if you have got any links, um, especially non-BN links of um, people who are interested working on it and who are likely to complete such a survey, yes, we would be interested to have these uh, contact details. Thank you. Um, maybe I have to add a few things. The first thing is, in fact, we did uh, such uh, test uh, uh, between us, I mean, between 10 participants. Maybe not all of them contributed, but a certain number of the group members uh, joined the test. And we really modified a lot uh, the existing set of questions. During the test, we find out uh, certain things that should be modified. Uh, maybe we have to wait for Sunday regarding the EC meet, meeting of BN. So we don't have to finalize it this Friday. So we, we may have some more time to test with a few other people too. But the biggest problem is it's a quite uh, detailed survey. Uh, during the test, people will, uh, how I can say, will answer the questions. Mm, it will be very valuable and we don't want to lose them. I mean, then maybe afterwards we should ask them once again, okay, this is not the pilot phase, this is not the phase, test phase, okay, would you please uh, resubmit your answers? It might be quite difficult because this survey is a quite, the second survey is a quite, uh, Mm, relatively long and uh, uh, more complex. Can I say it like this, Reynard? Any? I, I noticed when I tried to fill it in myself that you need quite a lot of background knowledge, not just about the basic income, but you have to know what your government's doing, you have to know about other basic income organizations in your country and how well they are cooperating. So you might have to take some time to look to see what information you need and do some research before filling it in. Even I, who regard myself as quite well informed, wasn't able to just fill in all the information without looking up things. So uh, be warned, it's quite, quite a detailed questionnaire that we're, the answers we're looking for anyway. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Annie. Uh, dear Peter, Peter Knight, I saw your hand right now, I'm sorry. Dear Peter? Yes. Uh, no, I, my question had to do with working group one, which I don't see, Hilda. It's been months since this letter was sent to the UN. Are we free to circulate this thing now at last, or is there still waiting for go, go? I, uh, I think Diana was here. Is Diana here? Not anymore. Uh, dear Peter, as far as I know, we are still waiting. I, I, that's the latest information I have. Oh, Tony would like to, dear Tony, please. No, okay. I, I, I think it was perhaps our last meeting or where it was said that the letter had been sent, it was not responded to, and since the plan was to send a reminder, that's what's happened now. They've sent a reminder and they're waiting another period of time for a response and only what, and if they don't get one at that point, does it become um, publicly available or available to us? That's my understanding. Yes. I, I can add something because um, the, the, we have got an answer from the UNDP executive, the leader of the UN, the United Nations Development Program has given a, an answer that is very, positive to the letter and they uh, and the leader of the UNDP says that they want to stay in touch and um, they want to uh, relate to uh, the people who signed the letter and that was um, Guy Standing, uh, Hilde Latour and uh, uh, Savat from India, so it's, um, it's we actually got a positive response on the letter to the UN, but the, only through the UNDP, and they want to stay in touch. So the next step is that uh, Hilde and uh, Sarivat and uh, Guy Standing is uh, relating to the leader of the UNDP. So that means we still can't uh, just distribute it freely, but it's not uh, standing still at all. 
things are happening and I think in the by the end of this week uh, Hilde and the others will uh, have done that next step and then so we are just waiting to uh, it shouldn't be far away that it can be public and then the, uh, the letter from the UNDP will also be public so that's a very good uh, thing to also spread when we are allowed to thank you good to hear Maybe, maybe can we ask Hilde to come to our next meeting and uh, tell us about, I mean, that is another two weeks away, isn't it? Or three weeks away to report back and let us know what we can do or shouldn't do. Thank you. Yeah, sure, definitely. Uh, I mean, uh, we can write a direct message to her too. I mean, in addition to the general invitations, uh, any possibility to have news uh, regarding this uh, letter. Malcolm, would you like to add something? Sarath has, as I put in the chat box, Sarath has given his apologies for this meeting. He had another meeting he had to go to. He is, he is now in touch with the UNDP people um, and he told me that, that there are discussions already happening with them. Okay, that's great. UNDP or UN? UNDP. The UN have asked the UNDP to handle this for the time being. Uh, okay. Uh, I would like to give an information. It's not very important, but the new uh, guy who, who was elected for UN uh, General Assembly, uh, he's from my school, I mean, my uh, high school, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Uh, his name is, I will write it here. Very nice gentleman. Okay. Uh, any other friends who would like to contribute about the working group number 10? I guess nothing else. I cannot see any more hands. Okay. And also, it was working group number one. Uh, Eduardo would like to say something. Dear Eduardo. Yeah. yeah. Good morning here in Brazil. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon to the others in Europe. And, and uh, well, I, uh, I had a meeting until recently. I couldn't come earlier, but uh, I would like to tell you uh, some news. Uh, the interest in the citizens' basic income, unconditional and uh, Universal is growing up in Brazil. Uh, we are in a very serious situation with the pandemic of the coronavirus. And then right now the National Congress is deciding whether to continue the emergential auxilium or benefit to to those people that uh, receive incomes up to three minimum wages per uh, per month, and they there is a, a, an a, an emergential benefit to all the families with income up to three minimum wages, and they receive. Uh, one or two adults per family, uh, 600 reais or a, a little bit more than $100 per month. But uh, they are, uh, they will decide whether or not to uh, continue this for three more months or even more, depending on how long it, the coronavirus uh, pandemic continues and it seems that it, it, it's going to continue for some time, I don't know for how long and uh, and in the, in the past two, three weeks uh, it is being organized uh, in the Brazilian National Congress the 
parliamentary front in the defense of the of a basic income, uh, a permanent basic income. And uh, there are, well, we have 505 uh, federal representatives and 91 and, and 81 senators and uh, uh, more than 100 of them uh, in both houses have already uh, signed and becoming members of this front. So uh, in the next meetings, I will tell you, I hope uh, more news about what's going on. And uh, I think that I have told you last uh, May 11, I decided not to be anymore a candidate for mayor of Sao Paulo because I have decided to dedicate my whole, whole energy to the campaign in favor of the institution of what we, it's already a law in Brazil 16 years ago in uh, January 8, 2004, after the approval of the National Congress by all parties, President Lula uh, sanctioned the law that institutes step by step, taking into account first those most in need, like the Bolsa Permita does it, until one day we will have an unconditional universal basic income to all residents in Brazil, including those foreigners who are living here for five years or more. And I and so I decided not to be a mayor candidate this year anymore because I want to dedicate my full energy and efforts to see the basic income instituted in Brazil during my life. And I, just to tell you, last Sunday I became 79 years old, so I believe that I will... Uh, will attain this objective like the the old Yukon that remove mountains you know that story you know and uh, in 1945 Mao Zedong for the speaking to the Congress of the Chinese Communist Party said that uh, he wanted to encourage the people to struggle to become victorious in, in their revolution. And uh, so he said that it, uh, he, he, he told the story of the old Yukon that removed mountains. And uh, uh, there was an old man that lived in the mountains, but there were two mountains that uh, uh, was being very bad for his purposes. So he decided to every day with uh, working to remove the two mountains. And another old man, his neighbor told, asked him, what are you doing? Well, I'm removing those two mountains. Don't you see that this is impossible? Well, no, it's this possible. I will come here every day and knocking with the, uh, and trying to remove the mountain, and then with my children and the sons of my children, and so we will remove it. And so the angels of the sky of heaven uh, became so uh, touched by the Yukong and the, and the angels of the heaven removed the two mountains. And so in 1949, Mao Zedong was victorious and formed the People's Republic of China. And you know all the results. So uh, I said that I, I have two mountains to remove. One of them is to 
institute the citizen's basic income in Brazil and contribute to do it on earth as well as and I hope that that I will see that during my lifetime. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Eduardo. Um, me, France, would like to say a few things about your contribution, but in the meantime, can I have uh, Stacy's and uh, Gabriela's contribution because they have to leave uh, early? Uh, dear Stacy. Hi. Yes, please. Awesome, thanks you guys. Um, there's, you guys have been doing so much work. It's been really cool to be able to get caught up. It's been a, a little over six weeks since I've been able to join you guys um, and a lot has, uh, has been accomplished. It's, it's exciting to see everything that's happening internationally. Um, we're based in, I'm founder of Income Movement. We're based in the United States and, um, and have been focusing quite a bit of our energy for the last six to eight weeks, specifically on pressuring Congress to try to get emergency UBI included in um, the stimulus packages that have been going through, um, through our uh, various um, government leadership organizations. And so we, we in many ways, kind of put a, a pause on the basic income march to really focus uh, most of our energy in that area. Um, but we're now, of course, as the summer is really kicking off, um, re kind of addressing the basic income march and putting um, most of our efforts towards that. So we have today, we're going to be launching, relaunching the basic income march website. Um, I'll send out to the listserv uh, a link to that as soon as it's live so you guys can see it. Um, we've been working with and, and having conversations with people across the country as well as Canada um, over the last couple of weeks as people have just started to reach out to their communities and within their different um, regions and uh, to talk about the beginnings of plannings. This year, you know, last year, which was the first basic income march, we um, we focused on just getting things up and running as quickly as possible. Everybody used different tools to be able to um, to publicize and promote their events. Most people used Facebook pay event pages. This year, we have a tool that will allow us to all organize together um, to, to collect email addresses of people who sign up for our events so we can directly reach out to them and so that all the um, hosts of events can actually coordinate together as well to share best practices, to share printing materials, whatever it is that, that we're all kind of collectively working on to give an opportunity to share those things. So the website will, um, will be an opportunity to, um, to be able to kind of have all of those things centrally located um, and a, a easy URL for people to send out to their community where people can sign up, see where there's local events, um, if there isn't a local event yet um, organized, people can sign up to host events. Um, so we're excited to be able to provide as much of the, as many of the tools and framework for people to be able to, um, to not have to focus on the technology and digital side of things and really just be able to do the planning that they want to do um, in their cities. So that's kind of the, the update. Everything will get sent out. Um, like I said, later today, the URL, and then we'll also send out an invite for um, for a regular ongoing meeting, I think once a week or once every two weeks for us. We'll see as a community what we want to have to um, for international organizers of their basic income marches to get together and um, and uh, share, share, like I said, best practices, um, ideas of what kinds of events people are planning based on um, the COVID-19 crisis and the kind of decisions that everybody's making around um, safe social distancing. Any questions or thoughts before I, I hand it over to the next group? Yes, Stacey, we do share that link uh, through the email group also so that other yes. friends can also follow it. Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll add it to the listserv for sure we'll, and, um, and we'll include um, 
um, uh, invite a meeting invite when we get our our, our weekly or bi-monthly meeting on the calendar i'll also include that um, to the, the full list so anybody can join at any time um, and uh, and we'll go from there uh, I would like to say one thing uh, during the last year's basic income march uh, it was a small group in Istanbul uh, but there were not that many media attention to our activity but after mm, nine months they used the photos from that uh, basic income march in the newspapers uh, last week it was interesting wow. yeah that's wonderful yeah we found we found similar things as well that the that the coverage uh, we had some coverage of our events here in San Francisco and New York, but um, but there was a lot of um, a lot of photos and videos produced from it of um, of kind of local activists, and those have turned up quite a bit in the in the kind of the conversation that's been having uh, since COVID um, around emergency basic income and the support the kind of large larger basic income community in the United States. So I think. Um, that it makes a lot of sense since that really was one of the one of the larger global events that we've had around um, kind of firmly making a case for the, the how much support there is um, globally for basic income that it's finally starting to um, show up in in a lot of the different um, conversations that are being had. Uh, thank you, Stacy. Uh... I guess we can continue to Gabriela because she has limited time too. Then we can continue our discussions. Uh, Gabriela, you should unmute. Okay, word is yours. Yes, can, can you hear me? Is it good? Thanks. Yes. Thanks, Ali, and thanks everyone. It's, it's really encouraging to hear all the amazing work that it's happening uh, all over the world. Uh, as we have been telling you in the last meetings, um, either me or, or someone else from the network, we have started meeting uh, in March with different with the different national initiatives here in Latin America. Um, now we have gathered people from more than five countries. And in the last meeting, we decided to start um, a round of panels, of mo monthly panels to discuss basic income from a Latin American perspective, since there is not too much written or, or, or debated on that. So we will start, we're having our first panel on the 7th of July uh, in Spanish. And we're gonna keep that going <clears throat> the first um, Tuesday of each month until the end of the year. So this will be the first time we do something as an emergent network uh, of, of the local nodes in, in Latin America. So we are really happy about that. And whenever we have our uh, advertising images, we will send it to the, to the network in case you want to share them around. So that's basically what I can report from the last few weeks. Thank you very much, Gabriela. Any would like to add something? You are muted, Any. There we go. Now it's okay. okay. Yes. Um, I was just waving goodbye to Gabriella, but since you invite me, um, it's a fortnight since we've met, most weeks since we have met. And in that time, there's been a very important document published in Scotland. The Scottish Systems Basic Income Feasibility Study Steering Group have published a very lengthy report uh, about the feasibility of a basic income in Scotland experiment. And they recommend that it should take place um, for the duration of three years worth one year preparation. And um, the only trouble is that Scotland doesn't have the devolved powers to do this. It, it, it says there are four challenges. One is uh, the lack of cooperation from the Westminster government and the institutions, that's the taxation people and the benefit people. And uh, also the problem of how to, uh, the interaction of a basic income with the existing social security benefits. And the other challenges are the costs, which I think can be overcome. And uh, the other one is what would be the work incentive effects. But in fact, there've been no reports at all, no evidence anywhere in the world, as far as I can see, that says there's a basic income is going to undermine work incentives. Anyway, this is a fantastic report. It's two, more than two years work. It's been supported with finance from the Scottish government, but they are not 
the initiators of it, they just funded it together with funds from the other local authorities, the four local authorities which initiated it. And it's such good uh, research work, I really think it would be a, fan a fantastic template for anyone else looking to see how, uh, how feasible it is to actually implement a basic income experiment. My own response is, we can't wait. We can't wait six or seven years to get the results. And this provides a feasibility study of how we could implement a basic income in Scotland or the UK if the Westminster government were willing. And the only thing that's stopping us is that we don't have the devolved powers. We need to be fully fiscally devolved on both benefits and taxation in order to take this forward. But it's a fantastic report. They've commissioned extra work from other people. They've commissioned some micro and macro simulation from the University of Strathclyde. And um, if you've got a holiday time coming, there's about 300 pages to read, but it's all great stuff. So uh, the website's easy, www.basicincome.scot, and you'll get all the references there. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Paul, please, Paul. I was just going to ask Gabriella. I've talked to other people from Chile, and they say that a lot of the people on the streets, they use um, people's assemblies, and they discuss many things. And I'm just wondering if they've used people's assemblies there to discuss basic income. Yes, I can give a quick answer to that. So uh, we were having, we were kind of in the middle of a revolution when the pandemic hit. And uh, yes, th there were many spaces of, of debate. And the fact that we are about to start writing a new constitution uh, was actually what made us come together. So we can advocate and, and put someone in the assembly that will will put the, the right to a basic income in the new constitution that's that's has been there now the the local more grassroots spaces have been shut down for the pandemic sadly so in the last three months uh the focus has been moved to to you know surviving this and we have been especially hit by the pandemic um, but yeah i mean i really hope that by the time we can recover that political conversation this will start emerging but at least until november december last year when i was on the streets in santiago this was not uh, an issue yet but it has become an issue now especially because of the uh, insufficient emergency uh, uh, basic incomes as they call them which are not um but yeah like now, now the word is really going around and uh, we have had a huge increase in interest so we're speaking about this every week in different places so we really are trying to build into that but yes Right. Thank you, Gabriela. Any other comments, contributions, questions? I cannot see any other hands. Uh, in the chat box, there are uh, two contributions, one from year 20 and one from Malcolm. Uh, Tony is here, I guess, or she left. Okay, both left. Uh, they were in a hurry, so they put their contributions in the chat box. Can everybody reach to the chat box? Okay. Uh, the France led country like this. So regarding the working groups, we have an idea about number one, number three, and number 10, basic income March, the letter to the United Nations and the survey. So the others are not present here. So, oh, Peter would like to say something. And uh, dear Peter. Yeah, hi everyone. Um... Can you hear me? Yes, please. Oh, great. Um, just to follow up on the Facebook illustration project, I'll see if I can share the screen. Now, you know, uh, at the Freiburg University in Helmo, and I are now in discussions with the changing. So this is this is the most important page. Is it's the it's the only thing that you see at the start of the Facebook page of the Facebook post. So there's quite a few things in here. We're looking at changing the wording, and uh, I think perhaps 
I'll come back to that because it's it's quite involved. I'll move on to the second one. So this is pretty much just saying, you know, we're getting a UBI. It's going to be on VAT. Um, the second one. Oh gosh, hang on. Where are we? Is this one? So we're trying to get one set of instructions to the illustrator. So I'm really trying to get down to the last bits and bobs and I don't want to keep coming back to it. So on this one, we're just removing the, uh, the donations part of it. It's included somewhere um, further. It's in, in, the, in the third one. Um, I think Reinhardt suggested that we put another flag in here for Japan. Um, I know there's a lot of work in Canada. Um, and, and other parts of the world as well. So I feel to leave the the three that are there because it is sufficient to enable every country to afford a UBI uh, with those three. And I want to emphasise that we're not we're not far away from from getting to where we need to be. So my feeling is to leave it with the three flags we do have. Um, so that's the only change on that. The third illustration, uh, so this is where the flag stays. We're going to change the redirected military funding to read redirected, uh, redirected existing and military funding. And I think that's really important because the existing funding pretty much if they gave it to the people, we're we're pretty much we're pretty much there. Um, so that's the only change. Peter, that so one. that's the only change. That one. Peter, I'm I'm not sure what you're showing us, but it really doesn't look to what you're speaking to. Oh really? Oh, gosh. I'm seeing a black screen or black slide, so it's. Uh... Oh. Sorry. Can you see this one again now? Yes, the yes. first one is this one. Yes, yes. yes. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. We'll just right. we'll just work on this one. The other ones are just um a small things. Now this is this is the main thing in any case, because this is what we open with. The the changing on this is we're going to put a uh, a park bench on the side of this track with some pensioners sitting on it saying the pensions increase to cover the VAT rise. Um, we want as many people supporting this as well. Um, so we certainly don't want pensioners to say this is a bad idea and vote against it. Um, they need to know that they are not getting penalized for the, uh, for the funding of the, of the basic income. Now, somewhere in the, in the top of this, we'll put in a rise in VAT uses the economy to fund a UBI and we'll have instead of the 10% uh, VAT rise we'll have models simulations and surveys confirm 70% of people are better off with a VAT funded UBI over 90% are better off with a UBI and an income tax exemption. Now, there's communication between Halmo and I on his Austrian numbers and using his, his, uh, his numbers, we've worked out that an 18% uh, VAT increase would pay um, for a UBI there and because of the 18% increase the break-even point is 60,000 euros in spending and the average amount of money available for spending in Austria is uh, 35,000 euros 
So I'm, I've asked for the table that, that shows the, the income earned, how many people earn how much income to, to be able to calculate exactly how many people would be better off or worse off with the with the 18% VAT and who spend more than $60,000 effectively. Um, so there's work being done. We are trying to, uh, to look at each of the situations. I'm recommending um, to Eno that we look at the worst case in Europe so that we can have still aligned VAT rates which is pretty much where we are now. Mostly everybody in Europe sitting around 20%. And Romania is the one that we really struggled to with my first project to, uh, to finance it. They're the ones that need the highest VAT rate. So I think the exercise needs to be done on Romania to see what their VAT rate needs to be. Um, if, uh, if the EU wanted to tackle this, as as a you know, as a union uh, to keep everybody pretty close to the same VAT rates union wide, so that's where it's up to. I'm hoping to um, to get a little bit of of uh, replies on the changes that are required, and really just sitting there and, and looking at the number of words that we're we're now proposing to bring into the front pages. It gets very busy and uh, I just wish there was another way that I could simplify it, but I, I just don't see an, a way that, that catches people's attention and makes it simple. So any suggestions at all would be appreciated. Um, thanks, uh, thanks very much for your time, guys. Uh, thank you, Peter. Audrina, please. Yeah, it's not a suggestion, but a question, because I discussed this VAT proposal with our one of our economists who made the, developed the proposal for Sheffield. And um, he said to me that it needs to be considered that only about 60% in high income countries of the gross national product per capita is spent on items, services, which are uh, where you pay VAT, 40%, I mean, especially obviously the higher income uh, population don't spend a lot of money on VAT items. So I just want to point this out because he said normally in his calculations, um, if you want to finance, I mean, a v uh, basic income through VAT, it has to be incredibly high in order to cover this issue that not every money which uh, is sort of calculated per head is actually spent on v, uh, items where you raise VAT. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's right, uh, Reinhardt. So the um, there's actually a, a set of tables that, so there's no VAT on rent, mortgage interest, um, uh, mortgage payments, um, and even, even the things that are normally got VAT on it. Uh, services and, and goods. Uh, it's only around 85% of the of the uh, of the products available are actually VAT registered. So yeah, that is all all part of the calculations. So when we come at the at the 18%, and when when we're talking about who is worse off and who is not, when we say 60,000 needs to be spent on VAT goods, so Someone needs to stop there and think, you know, I only earn $60,000. Not all of my money is on VAT goods. You know, I do pay rent, I do pay interest, and, uh, and therefore um, it makes the figures more attractive rather than less because, you know, there is that 40% of spending that isn't included. So when we say 60,000, you're really looking at, at incomes, which is closer to 85,000 euros as being the ones uh, this, that are disadvantaged. I don't know, Ian, if you noticed, but you're now the host.
Yes, I'm aware of that. Yeah, Ali has disappeared somehow. <laughs> Ali has disappeared. I'm waiting who to, for him to come back to the session as a moderator, but uh, I can't see him. Anyone else want to contribute at the moment? Ah, he's coming. Here is him. Ali, we are missing you. <laughs> you have you have disappeared for a while, so you're back. <laughs> So you're back. The word is yours. <laughs> you have to unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Okay, so then uh, while we're waiting for Ali, I'll just ask a question about the VAT tax uh, financing. Have you considered to mix the VAT financing with um, um, climate fee and dividend to have an environmentally scheduled VAT tax as a financing system? Because uh, the, um, the climate fee and dividend is uh, a part of the financing and the VAT is a part of the financing. So uh, some have ideas to have a um, progressive taxing on uh, 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 items according to, to how much of a um, um, problem it is for the environment, uh, both uh, according to climate change and to biodiversity by using resor natural resources. So has this um, like a progressive thinking about the VAT taxes been considered? Yeah, it's especially um, within the, the letters. So at the, at the bottom of the illustration, um, there's a link that sends us off to, um, to a letter that can be sent to, to local ministers in each country. So within that and the and the links in there, there's um, suggestions, especially for the African. There's five African nations with um, sufficient minerals um, to be able to fund a UBI in itself if it was taken over time and used as a wealth fund. So it is a it's a pretty tricky sort of thing. Um, I mean, you could you could really extract a heck of a lot and pay a, a UBI while the extraction was happening, but it, it, is it the best thing for the, for the economy or, or for, the, for the environment? Um, the other thing we were looking at is, you know, increasing the top tax rate. I'm, I'm, um, like for the Austrian, uh, for the Austrian um, work that we're just doing at the moment, I looked at keeping the top two tax rates which kick off at 50% over 90,000 euros and, um, and uh, 55 over a million. And uh, I'm, not very, I'm not very hopeful. So the, I looked at it for New Zealand's numbers and increasing our top tax rate 50% um, only reduced the, the VAT rate just over 1%. So you, you're really causing a lot of negativity to the people on the on the highest earnings for for very little gain so it's a really an amazing measure the vat is such a more potent um method of of funding the ubi because it does use the economy and i'm hoping that's something that that triggers things when they when when people read it because it's a uh, there's some real advantages from from being on the main artery of the economy than dealing with income tax, which is really a result of everything that's gone before. Um, to me, it, it is the answer. And the carbon tax, I'll see if I can do it now. I have got the, the second 
the second um the sec sorry gosh I'm really struggling I'm sure I've managed to do this correctly before um, I'm sorry about this guys it's been a real struggle this time here we go so that's the carbon tax and dividend can you see that now no 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 there we go so that's the carbon tax and dividend slide um which we're going to remove the one percent donation out of because it's on the third one and effectively it it uh increases the fuel price at the pump. It does also, any, any, uh, any power uh, also goes up. So it's not just fuel, uh, anything that, uh, that burns carbon. Uh, this is based on the Congress's, uh, US Congress um, put, put before Trump about three years ago. And uh, they found that 90% of people were better off if everybody got a dividend and the fuel prices went up 70 percent 17 percent uh, i'm suggesting that 10 percent of it uh, of that fund was is, is put into a world environment fund which is uh, it's actually quite a developed idea it's gone to the global um, um foundation for uh, for answering these sorts of uh, of problems so it's a, it's a real thing world environment fund which means that we get to choose where that money is being spent for the um, needs of the planet so um, yeah that's that's where it's sitting at the moment so um, yeah it's a it's an answer the um, I, I listened to the paper in Hyderabad about Goa and India in terms of the multinationals that are making humongous amounts of profits out of extraction uh, beyond what a normal uh, normal earnings are they're making somewhere around an eight 45 percent instead of a normal sort of 10 to 15 there's certainly room um, within that for uh, a lot of taxes I mean it's big money as well so uh, it's certainly something that's worthy of looking on and it is it is within the reports that are connected to the letters to ministers uh, thank you, dear Peter. Uh, there was a message from Reynard in the chat box. Uh, he, he had a suggestion. He had to leave. Uh, he said that uh, the financing options maybe could be a part of a presentation and discussion in a future meeting. Maybe we should uh, organize uh, how I can say, a dedicated session uh, just for these discussions. Uh, I guess friends are having uh, other uh, engagements and um, getting tired. <laughs> do, do you agree to have a separate session regarding the financing uh, options? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Then sure. we we lo uh, we missed uh, we lost few friends. They will be there also. Uh, can, can you write a title of such a discussion uh, by an email so that we can put into the agenda of the coming or the following one of the sessions. Okay. And maybe you can also put few names whom you think appropriate that they may be contributing like a keynote contributors. Because I know that you had a long discussion in the email group to tell truth I couldn't follow all of them. But if you can write the name of the title of a discussion and a few keynote contributors, then we can have a such a session, it will be very beneficial to all of us, if you kindly agree. Yep. Peter? Very good. Okay. I'll put it in. So for me, was that Ali? For me to put it in as a letter? Uh, yeah, the... title, uh, a title to be discussed and also mm -hmm. keynote contributors like Reinhard, you and uh, I know a few others were discussing in the email group, but I couldn't follow to tell the truth. Okay. So yep. today let's try to hear the rest of the uh, friends, uh, at least maybe they would like to say something from their countries. Uh, Eric, we can start with you. 
Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hello to everybody. Um, again, I really, I don't want to talk about Hungary too much today, but uh, I must say something. Uh, uh, it is a fact that Hungary, and not only Hungary, there's another country, I think it's uh, uh, Lit Litvania, Litvania, has the highest rate of in Europe of suicide. This is a fact. So it was always very high, but it's a fact Hungary and Lithuania is the highest at the moment in the European, for the European countries. So we have a lot of problems here in Hungary, of course. Um, and I remember somebody said, I, I cannot remember exactly who was it, but uh, was the person, but, but uh, they said we should stick together. Um, but what I'm trying to say now is that we, not, we should not only stick together with our words and uh, with compliments and so on, we really should stick together. That's very important because of, for our movement. And um, as far as Hungary is not a member of BN, as far I don't know what to say. So we are still waiting to be a part of uh, BN and uh, there was several attempts, but uh, we had not success, success with it uh, to enter in the end. But we have applied, as far as I know, we have applied. So, so for me, it's important to say, so we should stick together, but not only theoretically, not only with words, and, but also really in, with, with our activities. And uh, to, to look what happened in, in other countries, uh, we have to look at it very closely and not only talking about uh, economic, social and um, economic sustainability, but all the other problems we have at the moment, especially at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Becca, Becca, would you like to say anything regarding Finland or Now you are unmuted, Becca. Uh, nothing special in Finland. We have now the five weeks, nothing happens. From midsummer to beginning of August. Everybody is on holiday. Interesting. Yeah, Eduardo, please. No, uh, I have to return to other work now with the city council. So I like to say goodbye for you today, okay, for you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you. Nice to see you. Hope to see you again in the coming meetings. Uh, John, would you like to say uh, anything from Canada? Tony? made a contribution, written contribution, but written contribution, but. Thanks, Ali. Um, yes, uh, I don't know if you, you, you know the Canadian makeup of, of, of uh, our parliament, but we've got a lower house and an upper house. And the Senate has been, the Senate, which is the upper house, has been putting a lot of pressure on the lower house through the prime minister and, and vice prime minister's offices. Uh, to adopt a basic income and right now uh, the Canadian government just extended their serve which is Canadian emergency relief benefit for another two months and there is a big push on to transform that into a basic income so there's a lot of pressure on the government to make that happen and uh, definitely uh, keeping the noise up and uh, keeping the pressure on. Um, it's too bad Paul had to leave. Uh, he asked about uh, if there was any press coverage about uh, the, the labor unions uh, agreeing with the basic income. And yes, there was. It's it, it's not front page news by any stretch, but there 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 has been a little bit of discussion in the mainstream media about that. So that's all positive as well. Um, that's about all, uh, other than what Tony's covered. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, Thank you, John. Uh, uh...
Valeria, would you like to contribute? Valeria, <clears throat> she cannot hear us. Maybe Yishim, Yishim would like to say a few words. Okay, here you are. And hello to everyone. It was very, the presentations were very, very nice, but nothing to comment right now. It was interesting to hear the uh, aspects and uh, the financing thing as well, especially with the, with Paul's, uh, Paul's presentation about how this can be a worldwide UBI was very uh, motivating for me. Thank you all. Thank you, Yishu. And uh, Ian, would you like to, did I uh, say correctly, Ian? I guess this time it's okay. It's okay, but the correct pronunciation is Ian. <laughs> um, in New Zealand, um, we did eliminate the virus, but um, now the airlines are starting to fly to New Zealand. The only people allowed in are those with New Zealand passports, and they're bringing the virus back with from other countries. So we're now getting an upsurge, a sort of a second wave in the people who are returning to New Zealand that hadn't um, got here previously with the lockdown. Um, when the virus originally hit New Zealand, there was a big upsurge in interest in basic income, but that now appears to have declined. <laughs> so people are more worried about these people bringing the virus back to New Zealand. <laughs> um, we, the government has introduced a, a um, benefit specifically for those who have lost their employment as a result of the lockdown. Um, and it's about twice the rate of the original uh, benefit that people, other people would have received. So that's caused a lot of um, consternation from people who have lost their job before March and those who've lost their jobs since March. Um, the new um, Benefit is a little bit more like a basic income, but it's still a long way to go to be a real basic income. So that's about all I can tell you at the moment. Thank you very much, Ian.